for a minute. Uh, hello, I'm um, so glad to be able to record this with you, Blake from Clean Energy Credit Union and Sister Sue and Tom from FSPA. It's great to have you. Um, just Blake, if you could just give us the 30 second overview of Clean Energy Credit Union. I know you've done this already, but um, basically you're one of the pioneering first online only credit unions for clean energy loans, integrating so much of that you're now low income certified. You were just talking about the online banking portion um, that's enabled incredible growth with COVID here. Um, just give us the 30 second view and we can go back to kind of the yeah. questions that Tom was offering. Uh, I'm sorry, as you can tell, I get really excited about this stuff. I don't know if I have a 30 second version, but I will try. Um, so the Clean Energy Credit Union is an online only federally chartered credit union, which means that it's a 501c1 not-for-profit tax exempt uh, cooperative. And it's, democratically owned and governed by its members, like all other federally chartered credit unions are. And it focuses exclusively on clean energy lending. So yeah, we only provide loans for clean energy or energy saving projects. And, uh, and we are, our goal is to provide the very cheapest, best term loans to help more people to afford to get behind the wheel of an electric vehicle or put solar panels on their roof or to get high efficiency furnaces, heat pumps, uh, air conditioners, um, and geothermal heat pumps are very popular, electric bicycles, anything with a clean energy, energy saving theme. Perfect, thank you so much, Blake. I'll turn it back to you, Tom, to continue. And actually, Blake, could you talk again, just really briefly about how you were COVID ready with everything being online? And so you were really one step ahead of everybody else. Yep. So when we started, we, we decided to start as an online only financial institution or what I'm calling a 21st century financial institution. There are a handful of online only banks and credit unions. Um, and since we were starting from scratch, we were able to, to do it however we wanted. And we decided let, let's, let's skip, let's just leapfrog the need for any branches. And so not having brick and mortar branches means you don't have that overhead. It's very expensive to maintain a brick and mortar branch and you have to staff it with tellers and it's, it's expensive. It's a, it, 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 it adds a lot of overhead. So we wanted to skip all of that and instead invest in really good software, a really good online banking app and a smartphone mobile app. Um, and of course we have people on, on, on phones and available on chat through our websites. There's lots of ways that people can reach us and talk to us but it's all without the need for brick and mortar branches, which is allowing us to keep our costs even lower and provide even better clean energy loans to everyone. So when COVID hit, it was interesting because the 5,000 plus credit unions and the 5,000 plus banks, they all had to scramble to try to find a way to keep interacting with their customers, the ones who were used to going into a branch regularly. And they were saying, no, oh, please don't come into the branch. We, we, you know, we, we, uh, maybe people could go through a drive-through, but then they were trying to, to teach their customers how to use smartphone app and the online banking app, the ones that didn't already know. And it was interesting that we were just luckily already prepared for it. And you know, we, were, we were COVID ready because everything we were doing was already online without branches. And we were interacting with our, with our members solely uh, telephonically and electronically and things like that. Like maybe uh, if you don't mind, just provide a quick overview about uh, employees and board members, you know, how many are there, a little bit about the composition of workforce and then maybe any plans for, for growth. Yes. So we have been growing very rapidly. We hired our first employee right before we got our federal charter in 2017. Her name is Terry Michelson, a Hispanic woman who has spent her career in credit unions. Uh, she started a single mom uh, as a teller and she worked her way up over the next almost 30 years to become the COO of a multi-billion dollar credit union with a team of you know, two dozen, three dozen people. And she's what I would call a, a been there, done that, uh, very accomplished, um, you know, bootstrapped. Um, she's amazing. And we were lucky to find her and, and to be employee number one. And there aren't that many startup credit unions or, or banks. So it was interesting. There aren't many people who have that kind of experience starting up a credit union. And we didn't know if someone we were going to hire that's used to having a team of two or three dozen people being at a very large credit union could then go and be, you know, employee number one who has to wear every single hat and has to do everything on their own and do everything from scratch. But she was able to change gears wonderfully. I think she just has a natural entrepreneurial um, spirit and she has been great. She has led the growth of our team from one to about 30 people now over the last 
three years. So um, she, again, she's our CEO. Our, our, our team is a little over 50% women. Our CFO, our operations manager, also women. Um, we are pursuing more, more diversity in terms of racial ethnic diversity on our team. We are based here in Colorado. That's where most of our employees are from. And we, frankly, we, we haven't yet been as successful as we'd like to be in that regard. Um, and I think we were, uh, you know, we're, Terry herself being Hispanic doesn't, um, doesn't uh, absolve us of the need to, to keep really pursuing that um, for the rest of our team. The good news though, our, our, our board and our supervisory committee, those are the two governing bodies of a credit union. Federally chartered credit unions have to have volunteer officials. So officials are the board members and the supervisory committee members. Our supervisory committee is three women, one of which is a woman of color. And our board is eight people of which half, or maybe it's five are, are, are people of color. And I think it's, it's about even um, uh, gender, gender balance. But our, we did not at the beginning have a very um, diverse uh, governance team. And it was something that we recognized we needed and wanted to do. And I'm grateful that the entire organization is, is committed to this. And we figured it had to start with our board of directors and our supervisory committee. That was the very first step. And now we're, we're working on staff. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our membership is more than half low income um, and defined by regulators as living in low income census tracts. We have not been surveying our members as to their um, race, ethnicity, gender. Um, I think we're thinking about doing that in the future, but we see from driver's license photos or photos that our members send us, you know, after they've gotten their electric vehicle or with their solar panels in the background of them and their families, we, 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 we can see that we're, we're just naturally, organically, luckily, we, we have a diverse membership, but we don't have the statistics on it just yet. And, and when you asked about growth, so it's been very much the proverbial startup hockey stick curve in terms of staff, in terms of number of loans that we've made, um, in terms of the deposits that we have. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw out an easy number. We have made over 5,000 clean energy loans in just three years, totaling 75 million without a single delinquency or default, which is astonishing, especially through COVID. And part of it is related to what I mentioned earlier about how our loans save people money. Our loans are usually cash flow neutral or cash flow positive because they're saving people money and usually saving people more money uh, than what the, the monthly loan payment itself is. So we're, we hope that, that that track record continues. Um, now we've made 75 million in loans, but we only have 25 million in assets. How is that possible? We have been uh, another principle six uh, co cooperative issue. We've been getting help from other credit unions. So credit unions engage in what's called participation loans. I'll take a step back. Oftentimes banks will, they'll make a lot of mortgages. They'll package a pool of mortgages together and then they'll either securitize them or they'll sell the entire pool to someone else. And I know that that's, that secondary market is important for healthy markets, but it also allows the originating lender to, to pass on a lemon to someone else. And you know maybe those pool loans go bad or they're subprime or something happens to them. Credit unions tend to do what's called participation loans, where the originating credit union maintains 10% ownership, at least 10% ownership of that pool, but then other credit unions can participate in that pool. So oftentimes we'll take a $2 million pool of clean energy loans and nine other credit unions will each buy 10% of it, including us owning 10% of it. And so we're all participating in that pool. We're all co-owning it together. and Whenever we do that with $2 million in loans, we get 1.8 million back in liquidity to then go and make more loans. So even though we only have a $25 million balance sheet, we're able to punch way above our weight because we're selling participation loans to credit unions. So it benefits us because we're able to uh, get help from the balance sheets of other credit unions. However, it's very mutually beneficial because many other credit unions don't have enough loans. They have a lot of extra cash. They're looking to uh, do something more with their cash to earn a higher yield for their members. And so they like to buy our participation loans so that they can put that idle cash to work. But they also like it because we are, are offering them a new asset class that did not exist 
10 years ago. It's a whole new type of loan, a clean energy loan. It's very unique. And they like diversifying. They're diversifying the types of loans that they have. And then for us, we're excited because we don't want to be the only credit union doing this in 10 years. Part of our mission is to help change the entire retail banking sector. So that means all the 5,000 plus credit unions, all the 5,000 plus banks, we need to get them into the clean energy lending game and tell them this is a wonderful opportunity. These are fantastic loans. You should be offering these loans at lower terms. The, 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 the risk is lower than you perceive it to be. And the best way to get them to dip their toe in the water is why don't you buy a 10% stake or a 5% stake in one of our, our clean energy loan pools? And then you can have that asset class on your books. You can see how it performs. And if you like it, you can come back for more. And then if you like that still, we have been working to create curriculum to help train those other credit unions how to do clean energy lending. So over 50 credit unions have bought participation loans from us or participated in our loan pools. And I'd say over 90% of them are repeat participants. They want more. And they're all signing up for that, 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 that training curriculum that I mentioned that is done through uh, inclusive, through the what used to be called the National Federation of Community Development Credit Unions. They're the ones offering that training. So this is another way in which we're pursuing our mission, not just with what we do, but the you know, ripple effect of, of trying to get the entire credit union uh, sector into clean energy lending. The, the track record you mentioned uh, on, on the loans that you've already originated uh, is, is quite uh, positive and you know, your results are, are excellent. Maybe you could just give a brief overview at a high level, kind of how, how the underwriting process works. Yep. So our underwriting is not much different than what normal underwriting at a, at a bank or a credit union is for an auto loan or uh, a mortgage or, or something like that. So we do look at uh, credit scores. We do look at income. We verify income. We look at the ratio of debt payments to income, which is called a debt to income ratio. So we use a lot of the conventional tools of underwriting. But then we also can consider additional uh, tools that may not be uh, utilized by other credit unions or, or for different loans. Uh, one example is we will take a look at how much the clean energy project is expected to save on their utility bills. And even if someone has a very high debt to income ratio that otherwise would have been rejected by a conventional lender for something like a car loan, and we can approve that because we can see that actually this project is uh, is going to be cash flow neutral because the amount of money that they're going to save in their utility bill uh, is, is, is the same uh, as what their monthly payment is going to be. So that's allowed us to do a lot more lending to folks who might not otherwise qualify for another type of loan. Um, we, we have also uh, created a new pilot program uh, that's it's a credit enhanced program whereby we're wanting to proactively offer loans uh, to not just like low income members like, like what we already have, but also to BIPOC, Black, Indigenous and other people of color as kind of an environmental justice uh, combined with an economic justice um, endeavor. And, and, and bear with me here. So conventional underwriting says that if you have a high uh, DTI or you have a low credit score or you have a low income, you should be charged a higher interest rate if you qualify for the loan because it's perceived to be higher risk and higher risk means they wanna charge a higher interest rate. But because of the unique nature of these clean energy loans, like what I described, where they can actually you know, save people money or be cash flow positive. And because of our, 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 our mission and what we're trying to do, we are trying to create a program that will actually provide better loan terms to someone who is low income or BIPOC and, the, and you know, the historical uh, disadvantages and, and inequities, um, this, this is in some ways that's there where the environmental justice, economic justice comes in, um, is, is part, of the, part of the background behind that. But uh, we believe that even if we do that, we'll still have a very similar, like we have a zero delinquency rate, we have a zero loan charge off rate, a zero uh, default rate. We think that something like that will, will continue or it'll be very, very low and it'll help justify the really low rates or the even lower rates that we're providing. But to start off with, in order to convince the regulators, we're seeking um, sponsors or partners 
that will put up what's called loan loss reserve funds to help. It's a credit enhancement program. So to, to help backstop if there are any loan losses that we'll, we'll be sharing those losses with the sponsors. And that's what can help us to convince the, the regulators that what we're doing isn't, isn't, isn't crazy. You know, we'll, we'll first do a pilot program that's credit enhanced. And then when they see the performance of it, they'll let us take the training wheels off. And then we can continue providing those really amazing term uh, loan rates without the need for the loan loss reserve funds. Just if I can, one, one follow-up question on, on the performance of the loan portfolio. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been in a really strong economic environment for a while. Have you thought about or done any work on how you think your loan portfolio would perform if we go into, let's say, a downturn? Is there a reason to think it might have actually better results than a typical bank portfolio? Yes. Um, you know, I, I know that COVID was interesting because there were a lot of people who were losing their job and a lot of people who uh, had to go on unemployment and then that unemployment in some cases was providing more income than not. And at the same time, the stock market's going up. And so it was, it was a lot of mixed signals of, uh, lot, to try to tell what was happening with the economy. But we definitely had a lot of our members who did lose their jobs and who were experiencing financial uncertainty and a lot, um, you know, called us and, and we were ready to offer, you know, skip a pay programs um, with no questions asked. We, we had very, very few takers. Um, and at the end of the day, through, throughout all this COVID, again, we've had not a single delinquency. So that's not the same as the crisis of 2008, and who knows what the next crisis is, but that's, that performance track record is still, still, still great. Then we believe, and I think it, 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 it'll be hard to, to, do, to do research on this, but, but we're going to try, that because our loans save people money, because they're cash flow neutral, cash flow positive, that if a family is experiencing hard times and they can't pay all their bills and they're sitting at the kitchen table wondering which bills are we going to pay, which bills are we not going to pay, they're going to want to pay the loan payment because this loan payment is saving them you know, the same amount of money or more money on their electric bill. And it's going to help them to prioritize that compared to others. Whereas if they don't pay and that those solar panels get repossessed, then all of a sudden, you know, their, their net payments are going to go up, their net expenses are going to go up. So uh, that that's that's I would say that's the theory to be most conservative, but I also think that's what's showing through in practice. Um, and it, it'll be a big reason. I think it's a big reason why we have zero delinquencies. But when there is the next economic downturn, um, we think that's another reason why these are lower risk than than, than most banks or lenders would uh, perceive them to be at first glance. Uh, could you talk just briefly about who you would say are your competitors? I, I doubt there's a lot of other, we'll say, niche financial institutions like like Clean Energy Credit Union, but who are the people that you come across as competitors? And, and I did see recently, you might be familiar with this, I think there was a fundraising for a, uh, uh, a banking institution uh, that would be potentially a competitor. Yes. So we have competitors in different ways. I don't think we have a competitor in, for the whole package of what we're doing, and I'll, I'll explain. Um, most of the clean energy lending right now is dominated, dominated by fintech companies, venture capital-backed fintech companies. They're not banks. You know, you, you might you might call them a neo bank, but they they don't take deposits. They don't have charters. Um, they don't have federal deposit insurance. They're they're using technology. You know, fintech companies that we to uh, originate, they're like loan origination machines to originate these clean energy loans. They understand the clean energy markets well. Banks and credit unions do not, or at least not yet. And they're originating all these loans for a fee. And then the a credit union or bank is then taking the pools of loans that they make uh, you know, after, after that origination fee. Um, and, and that's who dominates the clean energy market. So I'd say on the lending side, that's who our competitors are. And they're, the fees that they charge are very high. Uh, there's not enough competition yet. Uh, and our pricing is better than theirs, partly because it's all vertically integrated, you know, one-stop shop. We've got federally insured deposits, which is the lowest cost of funds available. We don't have venture capital investors that we need to pay a really high return to. 
um, there are multiple other competitive advantages that we have, and it's why we are experiencing su such success. And we're you know we're less than one percent market share. There's so much more that that can and needs to be done to provide more healthy competition in the clean energy lending space. And that's why we're trying to get more banks and credit unions into it because that's historically that's where the cheapest cost of funds and the cheapest loans come from for anything that you want to buy any consumer product. And uh, so I think the fintech companies have done a great job of 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 kind of priming the market um, and demonstrating what can be done, but there's no doubt that costs can come down. So, I, and I could give some of those names if you wanted them, the, 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 of who those market share leaders are for clean energy lending, those FinTech companies. That's for the lending side. Then on the deposit side, there are a lot of, uh, let me take a step back. Um, you, you know, the, you all are familiar with it because you're, you're, you're part of it, but first there was a socially responsible investing movement you know, many 30, 40, 50 years ago, people wanted to do negative screens and not invest in certain things. And now that's kind of morphed into the impact investing where wanting to seek positive impact. Uh, at the same time, you had like conscious consumerism, people wanting to buy uh, products from companies that weren't doing harm or, you know, fair trade, uh, organic, things were doing good in the world, right? So it's conscious consumerism. Then there's uh, like purposeful careers, you know, people wanting to work in jobs that are, that are doing good, uh, particularly millennials, they don't just want a paycheck, they want to work at a company that's doing good in the world. And I think one of the next frontiers is what I'll call impact banking or sustainable banking. Not a lot of people are thinking about where do I do my banking? Where does my money spend the night? How are my deposits used? You know, a lot of people are banking at Wells Fargo and Bank of America and JP Morgan Chase for the convenience of it, but they don't realize that they're financing, you know, ongoing fossil fuel industries and, you know, insert joke here about the latest Wells Fargo scandal and things like that. I think there are a lot of co-op geeks and credit union geeks that have been doing their banking at credit unions, but they have less than 10% market share. And some credit unions have lost lost uh, connection with their cooperative roots, or maybe aren't doing anything th that interesting or that exciting. So uh, impact banking is something that's, that's new and exciting. There are a few others out there, like there's a couple certified B Corp banks. Um, there are a few credit unions that are doing amazing things. There are definitely uh, like CDFI, community development credit unions that are doing amazing things. Um, but we're pretty unique in that it's very pure play. Whatever you have in your checking account, savings account at Clean Edge Grain, and it's federally insured just like it would be at Wells Fargo, but it's only used, 100% of your dollars will be used only for clean energy and energy saving loans to other members. And that value proposition is unique. It's a, very, it's a high purity. Um, there are some really neat uh, entities out there and I would call them neo banks. They're not, they're not quite banks that are, they're trying to offer something similar like Aspiration is a good example. They're, they're filing for an IPO. Um, you know, Beneficial State Bank and Amalgamated Bank are two certified B Corp banks that have a have a compelling value proposition, but the story isn't as as maybe as as pure and easy to tell as as ours. So we have different competitors on the deposit side and on the lending side, and we're just we're we're this unique um, double package. I think I think you've answered um, at least from my perspective a lot of the questions that that I had, um, I did want to ask you to talk a little bit more about kind of impact. And, you know, there's so many different ways that um, you address what I would say is, is that issue. Um, but Felipe or Sister Sue, is there any other questions that you wanted to ask first about, uh, about the organization or anything about the business before uh, Blake talks about impact? So the floor is yours. So talking about impact, uh, we look at, a, I'll say we look at things at a high level. Um, the first one is the business that we're in, which is clean energy lending. We, the only thing we've been measuring quantitatively are the number of loans that we make and carbon dioxide, you know, estimates of carbon dioxide offsets. We haven't been looking at much more than that because we believe if we're, if we're helping somebody to afford an electric vehicle instead of a combustion engine vehicle, if we're helping somebody to get solar panels or to get a, a high efficiency furnace instead of a, a standard efficiency furnace, uh, and we can do that with better loan terms that makes the, you know, even if the standard efficiency furnace is more expensive, with our better loan terms, we can make it so the monthly payments are the same. That's, that's a victory for us. It's, it's saving uh, carbon dioxide, other types of emissions. It's saving the, the homeowner money over the long run, especially after they, they pay off the loan and they own uh, that appliance or that equipment. So for us, it's, 
we, we don't feel the need to measure any further than that because we think it's inherently, this is positive impact for the environment, for the clean energy movement, for community wealth building. The next category of impact is that we're a low income credit union. Um, more than half of our members being low income, uh, creating programs to more proactively reach out to low income and historically underserved communities. And I should say that those new proactive programs are in progress. I kind of I kind of alluded to them earlier, I mentioned them earlier, and I can I can describe them to you in more detail um, what we're doing on that front. But for us, if it's someone is low income or if someone is is BIPOC, I, I don't know if we need to measure much further than that. Um, we are not recording on every single loan, whether or not it's cash flow positive, cash flow neutral, and if so, how much. Um, that would take it would take some resources to do um, to do that on every single loan. But um, when we're reviewing loans, we're we're reviewing it at, at a high level to uh, for for the presence of that. Then the next category I'd say an impact is our team itself. So I mentioned, you know, our initiative to diversify our, our officials, our volunteer officials, so our board of directors and our supervisory committee and our staff. And it's just important to us that our staff um, you know, represent the, the membership that we serve and sets a positive example and you know, the, 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 the benefits of being diverse and having more uh, unique diverse perspectives, um, I'd say that's the third category. Um, I'm trying to think of other, it, it might be as, as, as simple as that, um, for better or worse. I don't, yeah, I don't think we're measuring, you know, you could, you could maybe the ripple effect impact of like how many, we do, we do quantify how many Canadians participate in our loan pools. Um, and how many of them are repeat buyers? Because I'd say part of, some of the impact we want to have is we want to change the retail banking sector, and that's that's one way in which we're looking at it. Um, you know, we're, we're doing lots of presentations, or uh, you know, helping with uh, like the uh, curriculum that I was mentioning about how to uh, train and teach other credit and banking professionals how to do clean energy lending, but I don't, we're not measuring that. I had a question kind of related to this on growth strategy. Um, just curious about any community partnerships or affiliate marketing programs or just some of the more proactive sense of where you think you could get um, some of the biggest growth in the decade ahead, given <laughs> you said FinTech. I mean, just curious if, if there are partnerships that you've been building about or thinking about or if you have the resources you'd invest in or how you think about just sales and marketing growth. Yeah, so we haven't, you know, spent more than five hundred, a thousand dollars on marketing since we got started, which is remarkable. We've got uh, almost more growth than we can handle. Our, our biggest bottleneck is, is is growing our capacity. It's hiring people. It's having enough capital to pay for more efficient, better software and systems, and and that's what's holding us back. I think we could be easily five times the size that we are now. And growing significantly more quickly if we had if we had the capital to hire more and to invest in more software and and, and IT and things like that. Um, so there's a part of us that doesn't want to. You know, we're not we don't we don't want to spend uh, our, our our limited finite you know budget dollars on on marketing, advertising, you know, traditional things uh, in the traditional sense just yet. Um, and same thing with PR. We know that we have an opportunity to get some. Some exciting PR, but we don't we don't want to go proactively seeking it just yet until we can build more capacity and be ready. Because every time an article does come out, you know, then we get we get swamped, and um, we just want to be careful about that until we can build more capacity. So, partnerships, I'd say, are, are really where uh, so much benefit has come from. Um, we have different types of partners. Um, one is what's called our field of membership. Banks can serve the general public, credit unions can't. Credit unions can only serve what's called a field of membership. For some credit unions, their field of membership is a certain county or a certain city. You know, the people who live in this geography are in the field of membership and they're eligible to join the credit union. For other credit unions, it's 
uh, employees of a certain company. So if you work at IBM, you're in the IBM credit union field membership, therefore you can join the IBM credit union. For us, it's certain uh, membership organizations. And if you're a member of one of those membership organizations, then you're automatically eligible to join Clean Energy Credit Union. And we have about uh, 15 field of membership organizations that are partnered with us and they're very mission aligned like Green America, which used to be called Co-op America, um, Midwest Renewable Energy Association, American Solar Energy Society, um, uh, Electric Vehicle Coalition. You know, they're, they're, they're groups of clean energy geeks and enviro geeks. I would say um, who they're, they're very mission aligned and their memberships are, are the types of folks who are really excited to join Clean Energy Credit Union. And they will often ask us to come speak at their conference before COVID or they'll highlight us in one of their newsletters. And that's a great way to, to, to find other mission aligned folks who might wanna join Clean Energy Credit Union. And then we have other types of partners who are uh, green home improvement contractors. So uh, these are, Companies that install solar panels, they install geothermal heat pumps, they install insulation. They're out there recommending their customers to get a loan from us because it better enables them to make a sale. That if that if they they can bring a financing option to the table that's really good, that has, has a story like ours, that has really low 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 rates, uh, then their customer will be able to qualify for financing and better be able to afford the to buy the solar panels from them. So they're out there you know, referring us to to their customers all over the place. And a lot of people hear about us from that. I'll bring up some slides. I mean, you mentioned a couple of constraints there just with bottlenecks around staff and capital. Um, do any of them pose more significant challenges in the near term, either one of those? And then maybe, yeah, start with that. Um, yeah, I mean, Bottleneck staff and IT, um, you know, better, better, more improved um, IT systems, and that I think stems from a lack of capital. If we had more, if we had more capital, uh, you know, if we were a, if we were a company, we, we we could operate in the red for the first five seven years, and, and make make you know outsized investments at the beginning in, in future growth. Regulators won't allow that with us. Because if a credit union is not profitable, they're concerned about the risk for the national for the federal deposit insurance. And so luckily we turn profitable very quickly, but they want to see us making a healthy profit. And we can't make enormous investments because growth costs money. You know, making those investments costs money. So the, the main way we can justify making the additional expenditures or investments to regulators is by having that be fun, fueled, funded by, by grants or, or donations. Let me, yeah. So if I could just follow up on that, a question I was gonna ask kind of relating to how we can support you, obviously that's first and foremost, probably the area where uh, you would have, um, uh, we would we'd be able to make the greatest impact would be through grants and donations, but as uh, depositors, um, how does that work and how does that help you? And then, I just wanted to ask when you were talking about um, loss reserves, is that another way to potentially support? And maybe you can talk about that. Yep. Um, so this is the list of the, the kind of like-minded organizations that are in our field of membership um, that I was mentioning earlier. And we're trying to trying to get more to join. And, and by the way, speaking of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, these are some of the organizations that have a natural overlap of mission alignment, but they also have intrinsically diverse memberships um, to, to join. We just heard that women in renewable energy industries and sustainable energy, this last one, has uh, their board has approved joining our field of membership, which is exciting. And we're hoping that American Association of Blacks in Energy and Green Latinos will soon join. Um, so the, the ways in which we need help, bear with me here, I'm gonna go to the proper slide. Here, what type of financial support do we need? Um, three ways that can be helpful. So donations that we've already talked about. Deposits are absolutely helpful. Um, we have a lot of environmental foundations, environmental nonprofits, other credit unions that have, you know, the federal deposit insurance limit is 250,000 per, per member or per account holder. So a lot of organizations understandably 
just you know capped what they've deposited with us at 250,000 um, because we are still a startup and that's how much yeah, that's federally insured. And that's wonderfully helpful for us because we're growing so quickly, we need those deposits to fund new loans. So an interested uh, entity or, or person could just join the credit union, open a savings account and deposit their dollars there, and that would be incredibly helpful for us. And our, our deposit rates are designed to be slightly better than the national average. Uh, we do have money market accounts with good rates. We have one, two, three, four, five, and 10 year CDs with rates that are designed to, to be similar to US Treasury rates. We have checking accounts um, that can pay up to 1% uh, for individuals who you know, use their debit card regularly or uh, have a certain minimum balance or have a loan with us. There's a couple different ways you can qualify for that 1% rate, but deposits are really helpful. And then the loan loss reserves. So someone who is willing to, maybe they don't wanna donate the money, but they're willing to make, as an example, a $250,000 deposit, and they're willing to have that money be illiquid and be part of a loan loss reserve fund, you know, pooled with other sponsors' money, such that that money's at risk if any of our borrowers default on their loans, then that would be like first first loss reserve or actually it would be in conjunction with us. Um, and that helps us to do those credit enhanced loan programs that I was talking about that we're, uh, we're actually doing a lot of those programs right now, but they tend to be for municipalities. Like I think I have a slide on this too. Yeah, here are some of the loan loss reserve partnerships we already have. State of Colorado, state of New York, a few uh, municipalities, Organic Valley Cooperative, um, a couple cities, and they're, they're, they're using these loan loss reserve funds to encourage their residents to do more green home improvements. We're gonna take a page out of this playbook based on the experience that we've learned there, and, and we're gonna apply that towards low income residents, maybe throughout the entire United States and BIPOC borrowers to, to do the same thing, to provide credit enhanced, better loan terms to those borrowers and we're seeking sponsors who, who are interested in, in doing that, interested in either the economic justice angle, the environmental or racial justice angle or both. So those three ways would be really helpful. Let me see if I have a, uh, another slide on that. Pardon me, bear with me. Yeah, well, this, this is intended to be like a, uh, slides that people people read on their own, but I'm, I'm sometimes I'm too visually oriented and the, the graphics are helping. So those are the three ways that, that we, we would love to have some help. So if I could just ask maybe uh, just to follow up on the, on the third way, is there, is there a rate of uh, interest paid on that or is it just kind of viewed as more of a, a deposit to support the, the reserve account? Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, I think we have a special deposit rate for those funds. And it's, you know, right now interest rates on all deposits are, are really low. So it's not, right. it's not, it's not anything, anything better than, you know, than a, than a, than a savings account or, or a money market account. It's something, it's something, something similar in there. So it's, but it is a way to have maybe a, a more, uh, more of an impact potentially to help support you. Absolutely. It would be yes. a highly, lever highly leveraged impact yes. because it, the, the money that goes into a loan loss reserve fund is, is, is highly leveraged. It's, it's leveraged um, at least 10 to one, if not uh, um, you know, up to 15 to one, because if someone were to put in, I'm gonna keep the math simple. If someone puts a dollar into a loan loss reserve fund, that, that can backstop, so to speak, or that can provide credit enhancement for 10 to $15 worth of loans. And then when those loans are repaid, we can do it all over again. So at any given time, it can it can provide coverage or or backstop or credit enhancement to ten to fifteen dollars or ten to fifteen x in loan. So it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a great way to leverage um, sponsor dollars to have bigger impact for the beneficiaries for the borrowers and and it translates into better loan terms for those borrowers than what they would otherwise get if they just applied you know directly to us and they weren't participating in that program. They would still get really good loan terms that are some of the best in the country, but this is how to make those loan terms even better. And, and just to follow up on that, just to clarify, right. would if, if you make that type of uh, uh, investment, uh, that's not insured, correct? I think that the, 
when viewed as a deposit, it's it's federally insured. So if something were to happen to our credit union and we were to um, fall apart, uh, th those dollars would be covered if they were treated like deposits. Or, okay. But if if then in the program there are some losses in that program, some like some of the yep. loans default, then the federal deposit insurance doesn't cover that. Got it. Okay, I understand. So you're you're you you bear the impact of losses, but if as long as you're continuing to operate, um, everything is fine. If you were to have kind of worst case scenario and there was a uh, dissolving of the institution, then you would have the insurance. That's right. So one way to, one way to think of it is it would be a in a normal federally insured deposit account, but it's being used as almost like cash collateral for other loans, and that's how it would bear risk. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. I, I don't. I don't have any other questions. This has really been uh, helpful and uh, so informative. Good. I don't either because you, in this presentation, have covered every aspect of the Catholic social teaching principles without using the terms. Your organization, as you presented it fits each of the Catholic social teaching principles that Tom had on the Q&A sheet, I think. I couldn't agree more, Sister Sue, and I think for other audiences that might watch this later, it's, it's pretty remarkable, the um, level of integral ecology and subsidiarity and participative in terms of the structure of the, of, the, of the bank, the way you define impact banking in terms of this next trend um, coming out there, this forward thinking nature, the way that it serves the common good, um, the way that it allows other participants, the way that you're educating other credit unions to do similar kinds of lending. Um, the, and the care for creation, is it fits so in, if there's a Catholic audience that is viewing this, at some point, this fits in with the Laudato Si, uh, which Pope Francis has put out and many organizations are starting to hear about and entering into as one of the areas of the Laudato Si action platform. Great. And, and I'll send you this slide deck. Um, I think. I, we have okay. this. Okay, great. Send it to me so I can keep it with anybody who might be interested in this later, um, yeah. Blake. Um, oh I was just gonna say, uh, Blake, if you could send us what you have, I think it may have some information in addition to what we had before, so it'd be really yeah. helpful. This is new, that slide about the loans. That one is new from the slide deck I have. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll send you the slide deck. And even I, I know we have a newer version because we just crossed the 5,000 loan mark um, in August. So I'll send you our, our latest and greatest slides just in case for reference or in case you want to afford it to other potential um, audiences. Before we close, Blake, is there anything else that you wanted to say? It's, this has been so helpful. No, I'm, I'm just um, grateful you're interested in, in learning about clean grading. I think it's been a wonderful success story because I mentioned earlier um, before we started recording just how rare it is for a new credit union to get started. And um, it's even more rare for it to experience the kind of success that we've experienced in such a short period of time early on. And I think what excites me is, is that we've been able to do this on a I, relative to what we're doing, a shoestring budget with an amazing group of, of, of volunteers, amazing staff, amazing supporters um, in, a, in a, you know, truly classic cooperative way. And I'm excited to think of what we could accomplish if we had more support, you know, if, if with, with more donations, with more deposits, with the, the potential that these loan loss reserve programs have, it's just really exciting to think about how much more we could scale up our impact in, in all the ways that we described it, impacting the, the retail banking sector, you know, I, I, I never want to underestimate the power of a positive example and a case study that, you know, our success is turning heads from other credit unions and other banks. And that's what's going to get them, you know, more interested in what, what, what are they doing? Uh, oh, it's clean energy lending. Okay, we got to get into that. You know, what, what's happening with the participation loans? All those things are really coming together um, beautifully. And we're, we're waiting on um, a key uh, legal opinion 
because uh, the Home Monsters Group programs that I was talking about, what we're, we've asked a, an attorney to do is basically say, you know, if we do create these special credit enhanced loan programs for BIPOC borrowers, that's how you qualify is by being BIPOC. Are we going to have, you know, a bitter uh, uh, white guy uh, say, hey, th that's racial discrimination. You're discriminating against me for my white skin color. How come I can't have the good loan terms that they have? And the initial thought is that actually we can do that um, because of the, the the data and the uh, of the of the the historical inequities. Um, we're waiting to get that legal opinion, I think, in the next two months, and that'll allow us to just to pursue that environmental justice, really, really exciting loan program. In addition to you know loan or moderate income lending, which we're already doing. Uh, yeah, I'm just so excited about all the potential here. So sorry, you can see, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I know I've been rambling here, but very, very excited about the potential. And I'm excited that you're excited or interested in, in, in learning about it. Well, th thank you so much for your time and for sharing so much information with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sue or Felipe, if there's anything you wanted to say before we sign off? No, I think I'm going to stop recording right now.